Welcome to Overheard, a series of conversations with writers behind the scenes of the Sun Valley Writers Conference 2018. So Karen, I wanted to start with one of the coolest moments I think from your session this morning. Um, a young girl couldn't have been more than 11. She was 12. She was 12. Yes, her name was Sage. She had a great question if you wanted to kind of get I, into that a little bit. So Sage was in the audience with her father, which for me brought back so many memories. When I was her age, I would go to all kinds of events like this with my dad. He was trying to broaden my horizons. And she had written out a question, which was basically, I won't, I won't say it as artfully as she did, but that when you became a sports writer, did you set out to change sports and how they're perceived for women, or did you just start out wanting to write about sports and it's evolved into that? Yeah. Seeing Sage in the audience with her dad had such an emotional impact on me was, I was that little girl once. I did that interview with my idol, Mike Bruner, and when he mentioned it in a newspaper article, it changed my world. And I think there was even something more personal than that. Last Thursday was the ninth anniversary of my father's death, and so I really feel his presence even more keenly this time of the year. So to see her with her dad, it was really moving, and I hope she grows up to take my job. Yeah. That would be fantastic. <laughs> and why do you think your dad was so insistent on take that leap, yeah. make that magazine? Because he was actually a really... Um, conservative person in his own life. He was not a risk taker, but I think the beauty of what he did for me was making me feel as if there is no risk too big mm -hmm. for you to take. And no matter what you do, you'll always have the safety net. Us, your family will always be your safety net. So dream big, go big. And that is a gift I can never thank him enough for because he supported me. Even I remember after my second journalism job, he said to me, well, I guess this isn't just a phase you're going through. I guess this is what you're really gonna do for the rest of your <laughs> and life. And you're like, like yeah. Like, yeah, because he had held one job at one company for his entire working for sure. life. So it was hard for him to understand why in my 20s I made five or six moves. He thought I was leading a gypsy <laughs> life. And I told him, no, no, Dad, this is what you have to do. You have to start at a small paper and then move to a bigger paper and keep gathering experience. And so I'm doing everything right. This isn't a bad thing. And I vividly remember him saying, OK, Karen, I guess I'll, I'll stop worrying now. This is what <laughs> you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. Well, I'll take that idea of family. And I think Norwich is a book that it centers on sport. You clearly love sport and yes. you take that athletic theme yes. because it's a book about sports. Um, but you're also not shy throughout the book to kind of openly say like, we're talking about a lot more than sports here. We're right. talking about family. Right. We're talking about volunteerism. What kind of... Yep. Did you go into that thinking that you were going to find those themes? I thought, oh, maybe I'm going to find this town that is very organized toward um, athletic achievement and has sort of a factory um, atmosphere where we bring you in, we um, develop you, and we push you out into the world. Sure. And that is not necessarily what I, that's not a value system I necessarily espouse. But to my delight, what I found were these athletes who were very much a part of their community. So they were supported and sustained by their family and their neighbors during their um, rise. After they became successful and traveled the world and started their own families, they would come back to Norwich and then continue to volunteer their time coaching. Everybody who grew up playing sports, whether it was through a middle school level or collegiate yep. D1, you usually experience a little bit of the spectrum of, I have some people whose families take that Norwich model and they are kind of doing everything right. a little bit spread out. And then you experience the opposite side of what you're talking about where maybe it's more common now to see 
the tiger moms right. or the parents who are screaming on the side of the right. soccer field. But what was interesting was in reading Norwich, it was fairly consistent. Yes, at except least, for the first Olympians, strangely that's, enough. That's true. And is that yeah. something where the town learned a lesson? Yes, I think they did in a way that um, only one of the parents knew either of the Snight sisters, but was definitely informed by the sadness and misery he saw in them, in their lives. But I think they had such a shallow footprint on the town that in a way they left no impression despite yeah. um, one of the sisters making it to the Olympics twice and winning a medal. But I'm so glad you brought up that point because there seems to be this misconception that you either do sports for fun or you try to become a pro, win a college sure. scholarship or an Olympian. And you don't, you think the two are mutually exclusive and Norwich is an example that no, you can have both. You can have this very organic childhood. You don't need to have the children specializing in sports at five, six, seven year-round training, going to travel, being on traveling teams, um, having their whole lives absorbed by one activity and still be successful. In fact, all of the research shows that from a physical and emotional standpoint, that is actually not in your child's best interest. Yeah. How do you ultimately balance these life lessons yeah. and skills of teamwork and kind of just trying something new with sports as right. an industry and a business that right. is entertainment. I had a really sobering conversation with a swim coach when I was working on a story for the New York Times recently. And he said to me, you know, Karen, when you were swimming, the major reason or major cause of burnout among teens in the sport was the over distance training. Mm -hmm. People were doing too many yards and some people couldn't handle it physically or emotionally. Sure. I get that. He said, do you know what the main cause of burnout is in kids today in the sport? It's not over distance training, it's parental pressure. The expectations that these parents are placing on their children are driving them from the sport. Usually for a specialized sport. Exactly. If they're focusing in to just do swimming. Exactly. And it's so tragic because you know that not one of those parents set out to make an activity that their child entered in with such joy a miserable experience. Sure. But this is what the what I call the professionalized youth sports complex is doing to parents and children alike. How do you come back from a world now where you say you have a good guide yeah. to give the parents the permission to take a step back. Are we going to take a step back? Yes, I sometimes feel like maybe this book is a few years ahead of its time, that there aren't people who, by and large, are ready to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. They're too stuck in the winning. We are all yeah. winners. We need to be <laughs> winners. The second place finisher is the first loser, sure. which I just completely refuse to buy into that philosophy. But I do, um, I think the madness is starting to gain headlines. Literally, NASCAR is now reaching out to five-year-olds as the future of its sport. That you have kids that are actually participating in these kid road races when they cannot even read yet. Sponsored by NASCAR? Well, sponsored by people who want to get the kids and the parents hooked for life Early. on motorsports. Sure. And I think about that, they're behind the wheel of a car before they even can read Cat in the Hat. Yeah. That's crazy. Last week we ran a story on how some youth leagues are having a hard time finding officials for their games because the f officials are being berated mm -hmm. so much by parents that they're just quitting. Yeah. So these are just two stories in a seven day span that show why the conversation we're having is one worth starting everywhere. Tanner, as someone who's already had a wealth of experience at Yahoo, at Sports Illustrated, and now at NFL.com or yep. NFL Films, what is your sense of um, what works? What creates, uh, what separates the very good journalists from the great ones? The basis for my 
sports journalism training came in college mm -hmm. at UCLA, um, covering sports for our newspaper, The Daily Bruin, um, and then eventually being editor in chief. So getting the training and then seeing how we trained mm -hmm. our new sports reporters. And I think our philosophy as Twitter is crucially important, Reddit, maybe Instagram. to more of a degree than yes. necessary, was to make sure that our reporters were learning how to get on the ground and learning how to be a beat writer, but then also how to embrace something like Twitter. Right. And one of the beauties that we always brag about at UCLA, which is the same at USC, is the wealth of a Olympic sport, right. where it's not just football, it's not just basketball, but you have water polo national champions. Right. That was the first beat I ever covered, was a national championship men's water polo team. Um, volleyball teams, you know, those kind of smaller sports, right. quote unquote, that give you the beat experience that teach you how to humanize. I've seen too often in the workaday world, young people who are completely missing the story are in missing important details that could lend layers and nuance to their stories because they are down like this. They are yeah. tweeting, they are, you know, looking, taking pictures for their Instagram accounts. And you really need to be present. I, I think this is a, a great lesson for me or any young sports yeah. reporter. Of, of listening. Yes, so I asked Tiger a question. It was the first tournament where I had um, seen him since he came back because during his first few tournaments I was at the Olympics. So I asked him basically, when you see how successful this fusion surgery has been where it's a pretty risky procedure or at least golfers consider it, sure. it such, do you have any regrets? Do you wish you had had the fusion surgery earlier instead of going just the rest route or a micro totally. surgery route? Do you even have regrets as far back as 2008 where you played and won the 2008 US Open on a broken leg? Yeah. Do you wish that you had done anything differently? And his answer was so illuminating. It's not often that Tiger lets down the mask or lets you in and sure. lets you see what he's really thinking and what how he's wired and he said basically well you know what it takes to be great is to ignore pain that would sideline others and to keep going I've been able to manage that and that's why I have achieved all of the things I've set out to do Wow, I was blown away by that response. And so I was trying to formulate a, a follow question and I was shouted down by someone who said, so Tiger, how did you uh, last week deal with the wind and having to play a different flight with your ball? I could not Deflating. believe it's such a moment lost to carry on that conversation and maybe draw out even more of From the inner tiger. From a moment that you had been able to see was yes. kind of an authentic moment that doesn't he come around often. He was showing us his human side. And when you ask, sometimes when you ask them human questions, it takes them off autopilot. Yeah. And they oh, that's not a question I've been asked before. So, okay, I'm going to answer this as a human being now instead of as a robotic performer. But then, boy, boom, yeah. buzzkill follow question. Sometimes with athletes who are not used to being interviewed, I, would, I will advise people to, before you sit down with them, go to their parents, go to their high school coaches, go to their college coach, go to their teammates. Find everything you can about them as human beings first, and then performers, and then bring that into your questioning. Use that to formulate your questions, because then you have a much better chance of them forgetting that you're a journalist mm -hmm. and thinking that they're just having a conversation like you and I are now. And I'm often skeptical when I hear, oh, that person is a really bad interview. Mm -hmm. Because I often, when I hear that, I think, no, we just did a really bad job of interviewing yeah. them. No one's been able to We unlock. haven't asked the right questions to yeah. bring out that person's personality yeah. or what is interesting about them. And one thing um, 
I heard that a lot when I first started covering the Jets for the New York Times in 2005 about Lavernius Coles. Mm -hmm. He was a receiver. Oh, don't bother talking to him. He doesn't like the media and he's a terrible interview. Really? Well, we'll see about that. So I did some background on him and then approached him and asked him, Lavernius, can we trade iPods? Because I want to do a story on you, but I think the best way to know, find out about someone, is to find out what kind of music they like. Get in their head a like. little bit. It, music, the window into your soul. Yep. So he actually gave me his iPod. I listened to it. I ended up doing a story on Lavernius, talking for the first time about being sexually abused as a child. And after that, it opened him up, and he really became so good with the press that mm -hmm. he was voted the media nice guy it's amazing um, by the Jets beat writers long after I had stopped covering the For team sure. so that is why I am always very skeptical when someone dismisses anyone as a bad interview because I think oh no we just haven't done a good enough job asking questions to bring them out of their shells Karen, it's been so great talking to you. I think one last thing that I wanted to point out that I've really appreciated and noticed from this whole Sun Valley Writers Conference um, is that theme of finding something that we don't feel is necessarily being told for Jim and Deb Fallows. It's going to towns in America that might not be quite represented fairly or right. accurately. And for you, it's going to find these athletes who haven't really had their stories told. Or you think you know everything about them, but you don't. and you realize you don't know anything about them. Yes. So I think that's a theme that I feel brings the conference together and that I've totally appreciated in your oh, work. That's such a huge compliment. Thank you so much. <laughs> I can live all day on that compliment. <laughs>